land rights is the ownership to our country, the country which traditionally we come from. Our dreaming places are there, our dreaming stories, our creation tracks are there. The white man, he talks about the cradle of humanity somewhere in Eden and, and over there somewhere. They're still looking for it, right? We know where, it, where ours is. White man, he's still looking for it. Britain will officially join the European Economic Community on New Year's Day. In the violence of Northern Ireland, deaths from acts of terrorism, the bodies of ten of the murdered Israelis were taken to Tel Aviv. It was a year in which the hopes, fears, yearnings and radicalism of the 60s seemed to reach fulfilment. A decade in which the young had fought to change the world came to a turning point in the new resolution of the 70s. That's what land rights mean. That means a lot of money, and that means a lot of people that are getting rich off your blood and guts. In Sydney, four young men came together. They were to change Aboriginal Australia forever. And so we made the decision. And we said, yes, Canberra's the place we've got to go. But the surprising thing was that all these guys who were very active were all of a sudden making decisions. Yeah, but Now, I've got this to do, and I've got this to do. I can't go. It's quick. Then the three blacks were sitting in the room who had no excuse. And I wasn't quick enough in the brain to work out an excuse, because I really didn't want to go. To be honest, I didn't want to go. We were uh, at the Aboriginal Medical Service and uh, we decided there was Michael Anderson, Billy Craig and myself to go down to Canberra and protest uh, by uh, going on a starvation diet to you know, try to capture uh, the Australia's attention to you know, the deplorable conditions that uh, Aboriginal people were living in, subjected to. And we said, look, that's the sort of thing we should be doing. But, you know, blackfellas being what they are, you know, like we couldn't think of anyone who'd go on a starvation diet, right? We really couldn't because we like our takarats, Murray. So, because we too used to be been short of a feed, you see, from the mission days. But anyway, um, we, we, we basically said, well, that's where it's at. Kevin Gilbert took us to the Communist Party headquarters in Little Sussex Street. The treasurer was there. We're just busting out of our skins. We wanted to get out, you know? We wanted that freedom. We knew inside of us, emotionally and physically, that our parents were restricted, and we were restricted too, but we wanted to bust out of that protectionist sort of cocoon. We wanted to get out of that. We wanted to be free. We got to Enmore and I realised that there was another black fellow who wanted to come with us. Kevin Williams is the name that he used, but his, his right name was Bert Williams. He was on the run from uh, the authorities in Victoria. Bertie! So, Bertie, it's incidentally, he became Bertie, Kevin Johnson. Hey, how are you boys? He was in bed with his girlfriend. Come with his brother? And he's the only black fellow that I ever seen in my life that got out of bed with a woman to go to a protest. There's not too many people would do that. <laughs> he made a major contribution to Aboriginal affairs. He's now deceased, unfortunately. It's a real division of labor thing. That's what racism is about. That's what the fuzz are trying to do, divide everybody up, you know? Like, there'll be heaps of fuzz down in this time. You guys could get arrested. Have you thought of that? I mean... We were all young. None of us had any degrees from university, so we were treading on thin ice all the way because we did not know what sort of murky waters we were going to sort of, you know, find beyond where we were going, we were just living day by day. You got everything? Umbrella, manila folder, plastic, laces. But that time we were all unemployed, we had no money to buy a tent. 
And we go down here and we went around to uh, one of Charlie's mates and uh, the best, they, best that they had was a big breech umbrella. Just five years after white Australians had voted Aboriginal people citizenship in their own country, four young Aboriginal protesters set up their own embassy on the lawns of Parliament House, Canberra, and announced themselves a sovereign people. What they sought was release from the complex web of laws which bound their lives to economic dependence on governments. The solution they sought was self-determination through the granting of uniform land rights to Aboriginal people everywhere. Back in 72, the embassy really highlighted to me what sort of strength that Aboriginal people have got when we all come together in unity. We didn't realise the psyche of Aboriginal people, how it would be affected by this simple action of raising a flag and calling our, our own protest an Aboriginal embassy and saying that we're aliens in our own land and that we're a sovereign people. And Aboriginal people came from everywhere. To me, the embassy was a last resort because of the things that was happening, the last resort. Look, we've got to do something, you know? And people could come together for the first time from, did come together for the first time on a single issue. The issue was land rights. The land rights the Tent Embassy protesters sought had moved on to the Australian political agenda a decade before when bauxite was discovered at Go. In 1963 at Gove, the Yurikala people had prepared a bark petition which detailed their right to the land on which they had lived for centuries. I was only 18, 17, 18 years old when the land rights started that I was fully involved in the land claim. The land right case was in full swing by the traditional owners here. The situation that's developed because of the wishes of the Yakala people has become complex. The cause remains simple, the bauxite. In 1965, a lease was granted to Nabalco. The Yurikala land rights itself. case was to drag on for years and was eventually lost. Instead of land rights, the people were to share in a form of lease and to earn royalties from Nabalco's mining. But that was yet to come. And there will be four, four Aboriginal people who will be appointed by the administrator in council. And they'll look at the whole of the Northern Territory. And if Narachin wants some country down here at Caledon Bay, if Mungarawi wants some country over here on Melville Bay, eh, then we'll recommend to the minister that you get a lease of this country for a market garden or to run cattle. Now, you understand that one too? Everybody who were involved in the, uh, the Go of Landright case heard that there were other people outside Gove who were supporting, and these were people down south, urban Aboriginal people. In capital cities around the country, Aboriginal and white protesters marched for two issues. Land rights for the Yurikala in Arnhem Land and land rights for the Gurindji people on strike in Central Australia. The idea of the tent originated from Aboriginal people in Sydney supporting the uh, Gurindjis when they went on strike at Wadi Creek. Uh, the English cattle company's vesties were paying the Gurindjis virtually slave wages flour, tea and bully beef. In 1966, at Wave Hill Cattle Station, 
in Central Australia, Gurindji people had challenged the British beef producer, Besties, over wage conditions. They were led by Elder Vincent Lingiari. I'm going to do with the land while I do something about it. If I get cattle, if I get a horse, I might grow a bit bigger, I might start something else more. We developed a slogan which we sprayed upon all the uh, Besties products in the supermarkets, namely that Besties sucks black blood. Now this campaign went on for at least two years, um, a number of demonstrations against uh, the Besties cattle company. Tonight on Monday conference, Australia's black militants. One thing that's happened since the coming of the white men in Australia is Aboriginal people have never known security in the sense of land ownership. They've never been able to own land. If they did own land, they were always pushed aside either by some big mining company or some big pastoral company. Now, Paul Coe, of the Wiradjuri people, fact, had been raised near Cowra. I was a young child growing up in a small yeah. Aboriginal reserve, a mission. I felt uh, contented, I felt safe, because whilst I was on that reserve and mission, I was just uh, another person. It's only when I went into the white community that I become an Aboriginal. Uh, whilst I was at my community that I was just treated as another normal human being. Coe's protest eventually led him to study law and to become a founding member of the Aboriginal Legal Service. The Rambi mission where I come from had a long history of struggle against the Aboriginal Protection Board and the Aboriginal Welfare Board, whereby all the young Aboriginal kids were taken away by the welfare and put into the boys' arm or the girls' arm. In my particular family, I had three uncles who were shot and killed by police. I was 16 at the time, and I was sitting with my grandmother in her home, and. Uh, she got the word uh, that Pat was shot and killed and she just grabbed her heart and she said, what's wrong? And she said, Pat. And I said, what's wrong? She said, Pat. Um, Pat's been killed. I said, you're silly, you, you know, you're imagining things. And next day, she knew, we found out formally, officially, that Pat was shot and killed in Petersham Station. And then sometime later than that, I found out another uncle of mine, Milton, was shot and killed in Unidata by a white policeman. And then. A couple of years later than that, I had another uncle of mine who was shot and killed was Frank McGuinness by a white man at Carrot. So that was my very early education into uh, Aboriginal politics as to why you had to be involved in the struggle because you couldn't think about it, you couldn't paint about it, you had to be involved in it to bring about change. The young group of blacks that I'm a member of is that uh, concerted direct black action where we ourselves mix with our own people, know the problems of our own people and try to find some way ourselves to try to overcome these problems. Well, to me, the legal aid, the medical service are the classical examples of this direct black action, whether we can offer to the black people specific skills which they need in their day-to-day -day living. Uh, One of the significant the changes of the 70s was the founding of Aboriginal-run so services. Without government funding, they demonstrated a new self-determination growing out of the urban community of Sydney's Redfern. Well, Redfern in the 70s is... Uh, somewhat different to what it is today in some ways, but in some ways it's very similar. You had the Haskin government in power then, and Haskin had a, an act called the Summary Offences Act, which was designed to push undesirable people off the streets. It was designed to control large students or other demonstrations, particularly people who were involved in the anti-war movement and the Springboks demonstrations. But they used those powers to control Aboriginal people on the streets of Redfern. Uh, in that sense, nothing has changed in the 20 years since then. The streets at 10 o'clock, or you're picked up for any charge. You go in the, uh, after 10 o'clock at the Empress, from the Empress to the Red First Nation, anywhere you're around there. allowed to stand still on the footpath. Otherwise, a pig comes along, he does know to get off nicely. It's... He just grabs you and say, says something like, well, I've heard him. Get the f***ing hell out of here. You know, I could tell of country town Aboriginal people where they've been arrested, you know, every payday or... Payday is a big day for Aboriginal Roundup um, by the police force, and then they, they arrest them for drunkenness, for um, unseemly words, this sort of thing, but it's never recorded. Very few of it is recorded, and they charge them about 10 to $20 to get out, you know. So where does that money go to? Basically, we just want to tip the whole place upside down and, and, um, and exercise our rights as people, but as Murrays too, you know, maintaining that identity and that, that, that dignity. Michael Anderson of the Gamilaroi people came from Walgett. 
I guess I was benefited by the fact that I was sort of pushed along by a number of people, and it was great to have that encouragement, that support from people. Oh, Pop Reese, he was one of my mentors in terms of learning Aboriginal stories. My grandmother taught me language and taught me a lot of stories. And I'm aware of the fact that she has a lot of knowledge and been sort of learning about places and sites and she's been telling me stories. And I'm in the process now of writing a lot of that up and I relay them onto the kids. And that's one of the things that those old people did when I was a kid going to school. Sort of maintaining my identity, telling me who I was, the language, the stories. And it enabled me to go through school as a blackfellow, as a Murray. And that's what made me sort of go on and do the things that I have done. Today, Northwest New South Wales is the focus of Michael Anderson's concerns. He chairs the Barwon Aboriginal Community Centre and lectures in Aboriginal Studies at the New England University. This Northwest area here, they fought very hard and strong against the white man coming into this area. They, they've never accepted white men here, and white men's not accepted them either. And so we still have a lot of friction, and there's a lot of work to be done. You know, they're all, you can go all around this country here. You'll find slaughter creeks all around this place here. Um, poisoned water holes where people's skeletons are still laying where they drank the water and died. You know? In this area, you're in Walker. So as British subjects, we didn't, we, we didn't fare too well. Um, in respect to the 67 referendum, it was strange that they should put a referendum up asking white people, would they allow us to be counted on the census? as ordinary Australian citizens. When in fact, from the outset, the white fellow was telling us that we were British subjects. You know, it's crazy. The referendum that at last counted Aboriginal people as Australians motivated new radical movements in Aboriginal life. The white people thought that, OK, they've done their bit and they passed this referendum and that was going to fix up the Aboriginal problem that existed. But you see, that was only just the start of the things. Then we took charge of this whole movement in Australia and it became Aboriginal focused. And, um, and we played that up. And we took it ahead and we, we formed our own confrontationalist party called the Black Power Movement and the um, Black Panther Party. And um, we certainly went for it. Now you're a member of the Black Power Movement. What do you see your aims as a member of that movement? <laughs> well, you know, since you're talking about Black Power, being a Black Power, you know, named and branded as a Black Power um, advocate, well, my aims are to see that our people um, are given the justice. Um, you know, my 1972 to me is the year for Aboriginal justice. The Black Panthers were on the rise in the United States of America. And they seem to be doing good things. They seem to be able to feed their communities. They seem to be able to house them. They seem to be able to look after them. So we thought, why not start up a Brisbane chapter here? And we did. Everyone has a right to defend themselves against an aggressive enemy. And it is inhuman, it's denying a person's human rights if you give a gun to one man and don't give it to another one. Young activists took a revived Aboriginal dignity in directions that surprised even themselves. And I believe everyone should be uh, allowed to have guns. We accused of all sorts of weird and wonderful things. We were accused of gun running into your car, which is total crap. Black Panthers, I think, was a statement of frustration about what wasn't being done here and what needed to be done here. And that Black Panther movement really expounded the necessity for survival programs for us to at least survive the genocide of war. In terms of the 72 movements, in terms of the Black Panthers, in terms of the survival programs, and even up to this point in time, we're only talking survival. We ain't talking living. And when you talk living, you've got to talk about your land and your law. Today, Dennis Walker runs programs on Aboriginal identity for prisoners on day release from Brisbane prisons. He lives and works with three sons on Mungalba, near Brisbane. This place here, Brown Lake, Lake Bramira, it's a sacred place. It's the place of the bunyip. There's a whole lot of stories about this place. There's a whole lot of stories about every place that can take you on this land. It's Nunakal land. It's called Minjeriba. And it is me, and I am it. In 
terms of what we're doing here, I obey my elders. But to get the job done, you need the enthusiasm of the young people, you need their perceptions. It's a fresh view coming on things. And I have a philosophy that the master is the child. You're looking to them for the pure essence, the, the unconditioned response, if you like. I've got a son in England now that doesn't even know he's my son. He has ripped off his mother through the adoption policy, forced adoption policies. I'm still following that down. Um, and I'm not unique in that regard. That's happened everywhere. And it's happened to a lot more people in my family. We've got our bloodline, we've got the nunical coming together and we're slowly piecing it back together. In terms of, of media, in terms of the politics, in terms of the law, whatever they make judgments about me in the material world, essentially, to me, it doesn't mean a pinch of shit. Um, I know and understand a lot, and I do my business properly, and what they make of that, they will. It's beyond my control. And I just get on with what I have to do. And they can say I'm a radical, they can say I'm a sellout, they can say I'm a traitor, they can say I'm whatever. It, in the final analysis, it doesn't matter much, as long as I'm doing it right. It, it, all I'm trying, all I'm trying, to basically, all okay. I'm trying to basically say is that the time of white domination of the black movement is over. It's time for black people to do things for themselves and get things for themselves because the only way they'll ever get anything, and we're getting it. It's void of any knowledge of the basic principles at stake. Unless a person like that knows exactly what um, we're on about. I think our, our, our thing is it's not so much what's happening. Go away, will you? We're doing something. We're talking about you. That's very nice. Pick off. I just came to say to you, don't do anything. Look, no, I don't need your, I don't need your, <laughs> your any, any advice from you. We've done all right. We've done all right. We've done, listen, let me tell you something. We've done all right in the past two years in Sydney without people like you. And we're going to do all right for a long time to come. We're going to get our bloody land, even if we have to f***ing or take it. And people like you don't matter anymore because you people had your chance and you stuffed it. So I don't, I've got no time to talk to insignificant little sh like you, so f*** off. When we first started, there was very little support. Uh, most of our elders would say to us, you shouldn't be doing these things because what you're doing uh, threatens us because it means that... Uh, they would then become subject to more oppression. I mean, people get used to a certain amount of oppression and they accept that. It's when that, when that level of oppression is threatened by a suggestion of bringing about new ideas or changes that there is the possibility of further oppression coming in, people freak out. And that's what happened. When we went down, we expanded on our needs, like in terms of the grievances, like the high infant mortality rates, the growing death rate in Aboriginal communities. Poverty was on the increase. And we just felt that discrimination generally across the board was very much rampant, and we needed to sort of get rid of that. We were unsure whether this was going to be an a long-term thing or whether somebody was just going to do it for a few days. Ultimately, we were there for seven months. I would say in the time that the Aboriginal Embassy was up, despite the fact that it was pulled down on three consecutive occasions by the Commonwealth Police, in the time that the Embassy was up, there would have been about a 1,000 to 2,000 Aboriginal people actually living there but not at one given time, but over a period of time, staying and moving on. Could you keep well back, please? Well, the Northern Territory at that time was governed by Canberra, and so there was a law that said that there would be no camping on Crown land, they meant in the Northern Territory, but that Aborigines were exempt because most of the Northern Territory was Crown land. It never crossed their mind that Aborigines would camp on Crown Land in Canberra, 
and the law will pertain to both the ACT and the Northern Territory. So we were exempt. <coughs> Within days there was um, assistance pouring in from black communities all over the place, including poor black communities who really had nothing to give. They were still sending money, sending telegrams of support and stuff like that. And every day that we were there was another milestone that we'd be able to reach. And it took quite a while for us to eventually realise that there was no law under which we could be moved anyway. Koori's come from all over Australia to Canberra. They hitchhiked, they walked. We got buses from Sydney. There was buses from Queensland, South Australia, Western Australia, Victoria, and we all met here. People were very interested, and people became more and more interested about six months later when, when Ralph Hunt, who was the Minister for Interior, and incidentally also the member for Guida, which is, which is electorate where we all come from, <laughs> um, the racist dog that he was, set up and they moved legislation through the parliament early one morning before the Labor guys got there. It was passed and within Within half an hour of its enactment and endorsement by Parliament, they'd moved on us. The women decided to go on the outside of the circle and put the tent in the middle. One of the reasons we thought that would look effective, you know, for the media, but we thought also that the police wouldn't come in, you know? We thought that they might think, oh, there's women there, they mightn't come in, but that didn't happen. They came in, and they come in in force. And I thought, well, we're not gonna move. If it has to be, we'll, we'll die here. And that standing there and watching the police march up, it was one of the most terrifying moments of my life. One of the great tragedies that came out of this was during the time that the embassy was there, and especially during the winter, the police used to come by late at night. And they used to come in the tent and sit there and we had a primer stove and we'd heat up cocoa and coffee and they'd sit down and we'd give them warm drinks and they'd sit with us and we'd t tell them and we'd be just be sharing, you know. And when they were told to come in by the law and attack us, they did. We couldn't believe it because, hey, here were these guys with whom we had spent hours and hours, night after night after night, sharing, you know, and feeling warm and, and we thought we knew them and they thought they knew us. But on demand, I'd come across and punch us out. They didn't have anything against us. It wasn't as if they were acting out of anger or anything. That was really sad. Don't break you, folks, come on. These people were not hurting anyone. It was a peaceful assembly. They objected this flag. You see the result of it, a deliberate act to create unrest. It's bad for the police, but it's bad for the whole nation. Eh? Who's won as a result of today? I, I suppose Australia's lost, and the Aboriginal people at least will have everybody in Australia know what they're fighting about tonight. We will legislate to give Aborigines land rights. Not just because their case is beyond argument, but because all of us as Australians are diminished while the Aborigines are denied their rightful place in this nation. Vincent Vindiari, I solemnly hand to you these deeds as proof in Australian law that these lands belong to the Yurinji people. The new Whitlam government set about granting land rights in the one place over which it had control, the Northern Territory. Following the Whitlam initiative, 
the Fraser government granted some land claims in the territory. Later, the Hawke government made further isolated handovers. Just before sunset, Sir Ninian handed over the title to Uluru National Park, 1,300 square kilometres of land, including Ayers Rock and Mount Olga. National Parks and Wildlife Act, 1974. A seeming frenzy of federal and state legislation in the years following the tent embassy often confused the reality of what was actually happening over Aboriginal land. While some land was being granted in the Northern Territory, in the populous Australian states where the majority of Aboriginal people lived, governments refused to back the needed legislation. A uniform model for land rights throughout the country was being effectively blocked. First of all, we tried to produce a uniform model. There was two years of work went into that, and it was the preferred model. In what was, was to be a final a fling, paper, the Hawke government devised a plan for partial comment. land rights. Now, the comment that we got... You want to keep this law here? Yeah. 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 And this new law that's proud and a bone, we want to chuck away. Chuck away. Yeah. Yeah. It failed because it abandoned uniform land rights in favour of land for just a few. So what you had was people in uh, Queensland, New South Wales and other parts of Australia saying that they weren't getting any justice and you had the people in the Territory mounting, understandably, and I must say I was with them, uh, a campaign of concern about the weakening of their legislation. What happened to land rights is that uh, the mining lobby was too powerful, the pastoral industry was too powerful and the Commonwealth Government didn't have the will to stand up to those vested interest groups and decided that the interest of Aboriginal people could be sold down the drain. National land rights should have gone on just the same. It would have gone on if there was a little bit of help given by state government. Because state government does have the responsibility of the controlling of the land. The national land was dropped because the state government would not cooperate. Northern Territory is very lucky that we've gone ahead and, and got our land rights, and it's going to be there unless some idiot in the political arena will come along and dismount it, like they always do. Well, some states have land rights and some don't. And even within states, some groups have land rights and some don't. And that's really the reason why there should be national land rights. And if things go backwards anymore, they're going to get back to having a different state definition of who constitutes an Aborigine as it was prior to the referendum. Those people who have no land rights haven't got justice. But neither do those people who have land rights have justice because within the Aboriginal community there's a, the notion that they should be sharing what they've got with us because we don't have anything yet. It's creating a lot of problems in the black community. Until we get a Prime Minister who is committed to the concept of human rights and equality and the recognition of Indigenous people's rights, that's the way the situation is going to be. Somebody's going to be stirring up our water and when we swim around, be whirled around in it, you can't blame us that we look like we're whirling. We've been sucked into a divisive pattern by virtue of the state governments being encouraged by the Commonwealth Government to grant land rights at the state level. Land rights, I think, can only be achieved providing Aboriginal people come together on a national level. At present, we're very parochial about our land rights issues, and that's understandable because of the way in which Aboriginal culture exists in this country, because one group don't tell another group what to do with their land. In Northern Territory and in Western Australia, Northern Queensland, the people are still on their traditional homelands, and that's where they're advantaged by the fact that they can identify their country. They weren't rounded up like we were and shoved off into missions, and that's the difference between the two. Well, land rights uh, is not something one can separate from the Aboriginal psychic. Uh, to be an Aboriginal in this country is to have one's association with the land and one's philosophy, one's culture recognised. Land rights is for Aboriginal people 
is to ensure their survival as a race of people. Because our dreaming does still exist, but our dreaming and our stories will be destroyed if we can no longer have access to the land. And they will be walking around Australia, say, in a 50 years' time, a group of people who are dark-skinned, but they'll not be Indigenous people because their roots, their history, their culture, their sense of being with the land, their dreaming, will be destroyed. I will keep fighting for it, and everyone that I know will keep fighting for it, and I know the next generation will keep fighting for it. Until 1972, Aborigines had shared a minister with Australian flora and fauna. When Whitlam gained power, Aboriginal affairs became a government department. A great bureaucracy grew up. And for a while, they were doing a bloody good job. Um, a lot of community organisations sprang up, and the bureaucracy fed those community organisations, and they were doing a lot of good work. But what we're faced with now is an enormous bureaucracy that is big enough to dictate to us. We started telling our people that were involved with us, oh, get into the, you know, young kids that were coming out of school with a good education, get into the public service, you know, get in there and we'll try and change the system from the inside. But what had happened is that, uh, I mean, that backfired on us. A lot of them got in there, they just, they didn't care about what, you know, the people, they just could, cared about themselves and money, you know, the money, the root of all evil. Today, most federal Aboriginal issues are in the hands of ATSIC, the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders Commission. Good afternoon, ATSIC. Led by 17 elected commissioners with 60 regional officers, serving the needs and interests of Aboriginal people nationwide. ATSIC uh, is uh, really new in that, uh, first of all, uh, it has um, a greater participation by Aboriginal and Torres Strait Island people uh, involved in giving policy advice to uh, governments. It also has a responsibility to coordinate government services uh, because it's a major funding body. It's a peak organisation because it has Aboriginal elected representatives. Very decentralised organisation. The first time, really, in the history of this country that Aboriginal people have been given so much opportunity from the very grassroots level to be involved in the decision-making processes. We, at the national level, of course, have responsibility for policy formulation and also for the allocation of the national budget of some $500 million. We are directly responsible for that. Where we've criticised governments before for funds not going in the right direction, it's our responsibility now. So if we seem to be on a very steep learning curve, um, well, I mean, that's quite true uh, that we are. I think it's been done deliberately by the Labor Party, certain sections of it, particularly the lunatic left. They've done a Pol Pot on us. They've taken off the leadership of Aboriginal Affairs, put them all in the bureaucracy and all the organisations. So what's happened, basically, they've bureaucratised Aboriginal Affairs. So everybody's a bureaucrat, whether they're in ATSIC or in the Aboriginal organisation, of which there are 2,000. Now, assimilation amounts to genocide. Uh, mainstreaming is the same tactic under another name. It, 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 it achieves the same purpose. It takes the best brains of the Aboriginal community of our, of our youth, indoctrinates them in a way that's alien to the Aboriginal people and then have them working in bureaucratic organisations in the bureaucracy, working against the interests of Aboriginal people and Aboriginal communities. And that's, that is a sad indictment upon this country. I think that um, uh, Aboriginal public servants uh, have a right uh, to choose for themselves uh, whether they want a career in the public service and whether they feel they can make a contribution uh, to Aboriginal affairs by their involvement. If you've got a good minister and you're a black bureaucrat, 
you can push through things and you've got a good sympathetic government, you can push through issues. But there comes a time when you can only do so much. Then the Aboriginal people out there have to say something. They've got to have a voice and create ideas and say we're going to do this and that. And they're just not doing it at the moment. We're begging, we're borrowing all the time, you know. We're going cap and ann all the time, right? We don't want that. We, you know, we're not beggars. But that's what we've been, we've been really um, forced into being. Um, we're, we're beggars in our country. And I don't like being considered a beggar in my country. Right? And all that the embassy stood for um, in <clears throat> at that protest was to get away from that welfare state, to get away from that welfare mentality. I think it is because uh, Aboriginal people out there now feel nervous about the responsibility. Uh, and, of course, there's no one else to blame. Australia Day today. Australia Day. Australia Day. It's the anniversary of the landing of the first boat. 26th of January, Also, I said earlier on, the Jet Embassy is being re-established again tonight for a whole week down in Canberra. The site will be the old, in front of the old Parliament House on the lawn where we originally established it years ago, 20 years ago. Ten Embassy Hall. I don't know anything about that. Do you know any point? Ten Embassy. The Aboriginal Ten Embassy. It happened way back in uh, 1970, and that uh, it's really a statement for uh, political rights and human rights for Aborigines in Australia. Um, did you know it was the 20th anniversary of the Tent Embassy? Mm, not really. My husband can deal with it. It does concern me that people know very little about the Embassy. In fact, it hurts me that no one is aware that it's the 20th anniversary of the, of the Tent Embassy which is a sad statement. I don't know, I think that, uh, you know, like it's just mainly remembrance now of what was happened before. Tent embassy. Nothing to me, sorry. I've never heard of it. Tent embassy with the uh, Aboriginal people uh, uh, putting up the embassy. Yeah, I understand they're uh, re-establishing it. ago we put up the original Aboriginal Embassy uh, to highlight what was going on in this country. Unfortunately we've been forced 20 years later. On the 20th anniversary of the Tent Embassy, some of the original protesters returned to the Parliament lawns with a new tent. They returned to restate the same claims they had made 20 years before. Come on, come on everybody, let's go. It's open. Straight through the on left hand door there. And right up the King's Hall, we'll park ourselves there. Okay. You go and do that and keep it here. No, but you said to me that you were in heavy fall and that you said you only wanted to bring a couple of people in here. Right. Now you're bringing the whole lot in. You can't do about, that. It's against the law. It's, it's all about good. Yeah, but it's against the law right. anyway. Well, we'll be gone in a minute. So can you get the rest of them out? Yeah, we'll get them out. Yeah, we'll go and get them out. Get them out. Yeah. Roger, in other words, you are requiring police assistance to get them out. Thank you. 
This is an official sit in from Aboriginal people. We're claiming the sovereign right over Parliament House. Uh, Why do you have to do that to me? We are relieving you of your duty so that so that uh, no, no, no. you won't get into any problem with your superior. Oh, you'll probably get the sack anyway. Well, if you get the sack, we'll give it a job with us. No worries. Look, I'm flat out supporting a child. And I need this job, and it's not my fault. You I told me that you'd been in here before, and then you bring the rest of your people in. I mean, you know, no, give well, it a go. Just well, why don't you just leave peacefully? Child. We have something to say, and this is one of the best ways we can express it. We're sit sick, sick of sitting on lawns and putting up tents to speak to people like you. We sympathise and respect your, your position. We're all now going to sit in the foyer. This is an official Aboriginal takeover of the old Parliament House because we want our own Parliament, so you can alert the authorities. We've got to do something. All these kids are going to be bought here because if the Jacks come here and they move us, there's going to be some kid lost in this complex here. All the, all kids, the kids in the middle, eh, so we know where you are. What do we want? Land! We refuse to move, we claim this land on behalf of all the Aboriginal people in Australia. And this is our embassy. Okay, well, I'll tell you right now that we're not going to try and move you right now, but I'll find out what the situation is and if you can just stay in touch uh, with me and uh, let me know what your intentions are. If they change, if you decide to move, well, then there would be no problem. But uh, I'll find out and get back to you in the next half hour. The Aborigines now feel uh, they've lost momentum that it's time to start it again. And so they've decided to set up another tent embassy. But this time they believe uh, this uh, old venerable building, the white building here in Canberra, ought to be their embassy. Well, Mr. Minister, we uh, thank you for your courtesy of coming here to visit us new embassy. I'll formally hand you our declaration of sovereignty on behalf of all the Aboriginal nations who are here. A, an application for Declaration of Acceptance of the International Court of Justice has presently been drafted and will be lodged in that application. If I'm asked by uh, other ministers uh, what your intentions are with respect to how long you're going to stay, what should I tell them? You will tell them that we have occupied this country yeah. from time immemorial and we will sit in this building. The statement that we make today is that we are an indigenous sovereign race of people. You are now standing in the old Parliament House of Australia. This is now a sovereign land claim on behalf of the indigenous people of this country. Police last night arrested four of the Aborigines who moved into the old Parliament House on Monday, charging them with failing to comply with the direction to move on. The arrests allow the Aborigines to have their cases heard in court, where they plan to push their claims for sovereignty. After two decades of intense political and legal dealings, Aboriginal people still live under the different laws and regulations of seven different states, as well as under federal legislations. Land rights are nowhere in sight. Just four weeks after the protesters occupied the old Parliament House, Australia's new Reconciliation Council representing both Aboriginal and white communities, staged its first meeting in Canberra. There will be a decade-long uh, program of public awareness and public education to educate non-Aboriginal Australians about Aboriginal history, culture, dispossession, uh, the nature of the continuing disadvantage that Aboriginal people still experience. Secondly, it's about a commitment to justice. And the legislation setting up the council is a commitment to seek to address Aboriginal aspirations as a national objective leading to the centenary of federation. And thirdly, it's about having uh, a rational public consultation about whether the process of reconciliation would be advanced by a document, a treaty, uh, an instrument of reconciliation. The Reconciliation Council comprises both Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal people appointed by the government. I suppose in part we'll have a function that uh, will help uh, provide advice uh, to those uh, groups uh, of government that have responsibilities. 
It obviously involves hearing what people in the community have got to say across uh, all sectors of uh, Australian society and uh, building bridges where we can. So really the council should not be seen as 25 people who have the answers to the nature of race relations problems in this country. Uh, they're there because of their own expertise and interest and willingness to make a contribution towards bringing about a greater level of uh, equity and participation for Aboriginal people. What is there to reconcile, you know, since colonisation? We really have nothing to reconcile. Um, they did the damage. They are the ones who stole our land. So why should the onus be on us to educate them as to how they oppress us? They can't be happy unless we arrive at a point where we say, hey, listen, thank you for having raped us. You were so glad you're here now. You, you know, you've been stuffing us up for 200 years and aren't we grateful? It's ridiculous that they would expect us to arrive at that situation. Let's start hard, let's start honest. This was Aboriginal land. It always was, it always will be. Let white people face up to that and let's blacks, let black people say, right, let's negotiate. Let's negotiate a deal. Give us back a lot of the land and all the rest of it and let's work something out. Any critics that might be sitting on the fence waiting to see what's going to happen should not be opening their mouth and criticising of uh, any moves that are taking place and the support that the government has put into this. I think everybody is making an effort to build something up with the help of other people. There are many uh, challenges, I think, that uh, are before the council, as there is before the whole of the nation. Uh, but uh, there are also clearly many people of goodwill who want to uh, see an end to the uh, uh, society where Aboriginal people are continuously uh, being uh, considered the most disadvantaged and hard done by. We've gathered here to perform a religious and, and sacred ritual to refocus the energies of the payback stone that have been placed from the design of Michael, Jackamara and Nelson. Power was sung into that by the Western Desert people and by my mob. The power is there to hang over the head of this illegitimate sovereign power until sovereignty and land rights comes to us. Today, they're also meeting about the Reconciliation Council. We've heard that old story before. In this day, even after 20 years after the embassy, we still have Aboriginal children dying from lack of clean drinking water, the very basics of life, medication, adequate shelter. We still have not a secure land base in our own country. We have no economic voice. We have no political voice. We have only the Crown and the agents of the Crown imposed upon us. The only free body we have is the Aboriginal government on the grassroots and the Aboriginal embassy on the lawns outside the old Parliament House. There has never been a legitimate deal done with us. Our sovereignty has never been recognised. Our lands have been invaded and held by terror and massacre. That's why we're here. We're here to assert our status, our right, and to stop the dying, to stop the genocide. And that's the end of the story. We will keep on. We will not go away. And as that stone rests in that mountain, and as our spirit rests in this country and over this country, we will not go away. Nor that neither shall our power pass and that's here forever until justice comes. <laughs>